This is number one of a series of 32 lectures on the book of Daniel. This is just the first verse. I've got three lectures on the first verse. So I'm just going to give you a little bit. And back in South Africa, I'll try and produce everything in English for you and let you have the rest. It's the most marvelous experience I had working through this book, word for word. The first chapter is in Hebrew. Then the second chapter is in Aramaic. Till you come to chapter 7 and 8 and then it's back to Hebrew. And there's a reason for it. And the way the book is, is put together is so marvelous. Chapter 2, there's a dream of four metals. You've got numericals. And in chapter 7, you've got four beasts, numerical. So the one explains the other. And then you come to chapter 3, Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, sorry, Daniel's friends in a furnace. Chapter 6, Daniel in the lion's den. There's a relationship. Then chapter 3, yeah, this is chapter 3, and then chapter 4, you have King Nebuchadnezzar having a problem, becoming too proud, megalomani. The same thing happens in chapter 5. So it's a tremendous structure. And little incidents in the Aramaic, for instance, in chapter 7, where it says that the Son of Man came closer to God the Father. You've got three stages. In the Aramaic, you've got eight accents, four as he comes nearer, and two, something of a divine nature. It is a masterpiece, I cannot tell you. And then, pulling the curtain, and looking at what happens when you pray for, for a person. Daniel prayed for three weeks. At the end of that third week, it was on a Sabbath. He received the, the visions of the last three chapters of the book of Daniel. He was 88 years old. John the, John the Beloved also had a vision on the Sabbath when he was about 88 years old. Interesting Correlations. And you cannot understand the book of Revelation without studying the book of Daniel. Uh, the book of Revelation builds on the prophecies of Daniel. And you've got to work through it very meticulously. I brought in all the tools in my research, like eschatology. The book speaks of the end of time, end of time, end of time. And of course, Jesus is the, is the theme of the book. It's a marvelous book. I wish I could have told you everything in 30 minutes. It's impossible. So what comes to your mind when you hear the name Daniel? Daniel means God is my judge. God is my judge. Laodicea, the last church the judgment of the people. The center of the book speaks of judgment. The books have been opened. And the center of the book of Revelation, chapter 14, judgment has come. Judgment is not bad news. It's wonderful news. He's the only righteous judge. Your case will be answered and uh, you will be satisfied. It's a wonderful book. And uh, the first few lectures is a description of the political landscape during the time of Daniel. He was a contemporary of the good king Josiah. He knew about Pharaoh Necho who moved up to support the last few Syrians because Syria was the buffer between Babylon and Egypt. And the Babylonians were becoming might a mighty uh, factor in the military world. 
Daniel knew this all. And then, of course, the exile to Babylon at the Balawat Gate in the London Museum, British Museum, you see the plight of exiles. The Bible said they were taken naked. And there, there you see naked people. It was such a humiliation. And Daniel was chosen to work in the king's palace. So he had to become a eunuch. A young man of 17. He never complained. He was a marvelous man. I love the book of Daniel. There's so much to enrich your life. And once you've studied that book, you have a new appreciation for God. His prayers. And then chapter 9. I remember once in Jerusalem, I go there every year, it was, I heard a big noise and I went out and it was snowing in Jerusalem. And one of the branches broke and I met a man from New York, a Jewish pastor. He said to me, he read Daniel chapter 9 and he realized that the Messiah has come. This is the greatest prophetic messianic prophecy in the Bible, giving you the exact date of the baptism of Jesus, the exact date of his death on the cross of Calvary. It is marvelous. And the structure of the book, oh, I get so excited when I come to the book of Daniel. Well, we'll just touch and I'll just give you a little introduction to this great book. There are stories and there are prophecies. And all the stories has got eschatological value. <laughs> the furnace, a universal decree to worship against God's law and image. You get the antitypical image in chapter 13 of Revelation. The same thing happens in chapter 6. Daniel in the, the lion's den. It is a marvelous book. Study it, read it, and something will happen to you. Then the furnace. What an inspiring story about heroic behavior. And I was so excited. I was in Lebanon once and somebody told me about a huge inscription made by Nebuchadnezzar at Wadi Briza. So Walter and myself went there and we found this. And I took pictures and I gave it to my professor who taught me Sumerian. I said, please, uh, translate this cuneiform for me because it was a bit worn. He couldn't. And then I asked another university to please translate this for me because this is important. Eventually, I got the translation in a huge book which I got for my 100th birthday or 90th. I can't remember. But here was the translation of the inscription at Wadi Briza. And you know what? Nebuchadnezzar says, I erected a huge image. So what you read in chapter 3, archaeology can back it up. I saw it with my eyes. I read that. It is a marvelous book. You can believe it from start to finish. So what happened here, the fiery furnace is going to be repeated. Of course, there's a reason why he erected this. There was a, a, a rebellion in the army and he wanted the loyalty of everybody. So he erected this. We believe it's Bel Marduk, the main god in the pantheon of Babylonian gods and he wanted everybody to worship. And King Zedekiah from Jerusalem came and he bowed before that image. But three young men said, no. We'll die, but we will be loyal to God. This is a message for young people. Stand on principles. Did this story inspire you, O oh, King? And I like the way Nebuchadnezzar treated people. They said to him, 
There are three Hebrews that did not bow when the pop orchestra of Babylon started their, their music. By the way, music and Babylon, that's another story. So he, he called them, and instead of believing what others said, he asked them, they say you did not bow down. Is that true? This is great. And then this wonderful king, I researched him all over the Middle East. I've got such a lot of information. Eventually this man became converted. He had two conversions and then the third one, he wrote his autobiography in chapter 4. And I hope that the archaeolog archaeologist will one day find that inscription. Oh, that's a great book. Young children love to hear the story of Daniel in the lion's den. What a story. Lions in Babylon? Well, they discovered reliefs of lions in Iraq. It was there. You can believe everything in the Bible. What effect does the story have on you? It's not just a local story. It speaks of an end time event. As a young person, the prophecy fascinated me. In less than 300 words, Daniel appears before Nebuchadnezzar, Nabu Kuduri Usar. And I've been to the throne room. Saddam Hussein reconstructed the southern palace of Babylon with 60 million bricks. You should see it. I was so happy when I saw this the first time. And I walked into the throne room and I could see the prophet standing before the king, explaining the history of the world in less than 300 words from the time of Nebuchadnezzar to the time of the feet and the rock coming down. And the way the prophecies progress is so marvelous. You have the feet of clay and iron. Now whenever you read about clay in the Bible, it speaks of the potter. So it speaks of a religious situation. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. So immediately when you study clay in the Bible, you come to the conclusion, here is a religious situation. In Isaiah you have one verse where the clay tells the potter what to do. So this is bad clay telling God what to do. But you get a progression and in chapter 7, with the beasts, you have another component a little on, eyes like a, and a mouth like a man. So here's the man component, you get more information. Then chapter 11, it speaks of the king of the south and the king of the north, elaborating on the feet of iron and clay. That's a great book. Oh, it's a great book. At first, the vision of the four beasts puzzled me. Oh, what's going on here? But when you study it through the angle of archaeology, a new world comes alive. It is so meticulously accurate. But now I enjoy it. And when you come to Revelation 13, uh, John uses all four of them in a reverse order, and there's a reason for it. Chapter 7 tells us about Jesus the King. That's beautiful. What is the message that it brings to your heart today? You know, we are looking for decent rulers, decent kings and prime ministers. Somehow they don't answer our expectations. But King Jesus will soon rule. 
the cosmos. He needs to rule my heart now. Chapter 8 speaks of him as the high priest. First the king, then the high priest. What was his function? Uh, he interceded between the sinner and God. What is Jesus doing today? The book of Hebrews says he's our high priest. Chapter 9 predicts that Jesus would die for the sins of mankind. Now here is something interesting. The way the Semitic brain works. We uh, argue from cause to effect. The Hebrew mind is just different from effect to cause. He's king, chapter 7. How did he become king? Well, chapter 8 says he was a high priest. How did, he, how did he become a priest? Well, he died as a lamb. And these insights which we gather from archaeology makes the Bible logic and fascinating. Oh, I love the book of Daniel. How accurate is this prophecy fulfilled? This is, this is tremendous. It works on prophecies, 70 weeks, and 2,300 days, evenings and mornings. Chapter 7 starts with wind, man, animals. He uses the language of Genesis 1. It's a great book. It's a great book. I visited Susan in uh, Iran, and here I discovered the tomb of Daniel, the Ula River. What vision did he receive here? The vision is chapter 8 of Daniel. A ram and a he goat. Sacrificial offerings. He wants to take our mind to the sanctuary. Oh, it's a great book. The, the Karke River, the Ulai, as we read it in the Bible, is probably the eastern tributary of the Koaspes River. And here you see the river. According to the Greek researcher Herodotus, the Persians regarded the Koaspes as a sacred river and considered its water to be the most pure in the world. The Achaemenid king was supposed to drink only water from the Koaspes, histories of Herodotus. Listen to this river story. The small Iraqi village was in turmoil as people hurled insults and uh, maledictions from one side to the other side of the Toaster River. Conflict is part of life. Women wailed and cursed, men sharpened their knives, children trembled at the dawn of another Middle Eastern conflict. The problem was a question of was, was not a question of oil or the Jews versus the Arabs, but an old legend concerning Daniel's coffin. Ancient belief regarded the bones of the prophet as an omen of good luck. Observing that the inhabitants on the bank where lay the prophet's tomb were prosperous and happy, while those on the other side were unhappy and poor, the latter naturally sought to have the tomb transferred to their side of the river. Of course it's nonsense, but let's continue. The conflict was about to explode when, after much discussion, a compromise settled the matter. The villagers would move the coffin every other year to the other bank and so to benefit both sides. That sounds logic. The practice lasted several years until the visit of King Sagarshah, who thought the frequent disinterments dishonored the memory of the prophet. Under his supervision, the villagers chained the coffin to the middle of the bridge at an equal distance from both banks. Daniel was then for everybody. 
So Daniel is for everybody. <laughs> for you and for me. The story as told by 12th century traveller Benjamin of Tudele echoes on. A small 12 chapter document lost in the folds of the ancient Bible and the only actual remains of the ancient prophet. The book of Daniel contains a universal message that transcends denominations and cultures. The book of Daniel concerns all of us. Judaism, what do they say about the book of Daniel? They say he is the greatest prophet. This is Flavius Josephus. Connects specific dates to his prophecies. The most accurate prophecies you find in this book. Daniel 7.25. Here he speaks of a time times and half a time add it all up one two six oh days and in a day a day in a prophetic context always stands for a year and you get this principle right through the bible there are many incidences and here's another one no one understand this from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild jerusalem which was done by Artesasta, and I visited his tomb at Naxi and Rustam in Iran, until the Anointed One, who's the Anointed One? The Messiah, the ruler, comes. There will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be built with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. This is a fantastic messianic prophecy. From the issue of the date till the baptism of Jesus, it's being fulfilled to the T. I cannot go into it now, it's in the lecture. Kirbet Qumran, hidden scrolls, a portion of 4Q, Dan, showing the line break from the Aramaic to the Hebrew between chapters 7 and 8, the original. Manuscript of three centuries BC. By the way, the critic says that this book was written in 178-179 BC by a pseudo Daniel. But look at this. <laughs> Piece of literature, three centuries BC. They fail. There is a war against the book of Daniel to mix up the message or to tell people that this is a post-exilic manuscript. Archaeology says no, what the Bible says is true. This comes from six, six centuries BC. The Aramaic, everything points to a very old document. Almost all the chapters of the book, Daniel has been discovered. So, there are 12 chapters, they've just dis about discovered everything. And one of these days, there will be a new news release on the translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Daniel was also read by the Essenes. These are the people who lived at Kirbet Qumran. Kirbet means rooms. A very interesting group of people. They preached next to, da to uh, John the Baptist and they were so close to one another but when the Messiah came they rejected him. Uh, Daniel surpassed all the wise men in knowledge. The Talmud, Hebrew means instruction, learning, from a root Teach, study, is a record of rabbinic discussions pertaining to the Jewish law, ethics, customs and history. It is a central text of mainstream Judaism. What do they say about the book of Daniel? They say Daniel and Jacob are the only two that received end time revelations from God. Well, there are others as well. 
But this is what they said in Midrash. What happened at Wittenberg? 96 statements changed the history of the world forever. While Luther was translating the Bible into German, he mentioned that the book of Daniel should be the very first to be published. He was so excited when he translated the book of Daniel. This should be the first publication. The reformers wrote a flood of commentaries on the gripping book of Daniel. The church of John Calvin in Geneva. I visited this church and there were only a few people. I visited St. Peter's and I couldn't get in. The book of Daniel became the central theme in his Bible conferences. This is John Calvin. Will we encounter Daniel in the Sistine Chapel? Oh, this is something you should see, this chapel. Looking up at Michelangelo's paintings. Yes. And is it possible that Michelangelo was inspired by the life of this great prophet? I think so. There's Daniel by Michelangelo. Look up the Sistine Chapel and you'll see it. Could the study of the life of Daniel have changed the life of Michelangelo? I think so. How will the study of this incredible book change our lives? It changed my life. I have a new appreciation of God. The way he cares about us. The way he reveals the future to us. It's a marvelous book. I visited the famous Metz Cathedral in France. This is very interesting. Uh, may God be with us while we meditate on this great man of God. Uh, Daniel, you can see him now, is part of the art at Metz. So when Kaiser Wilhelm wanted to conquer Europe, somebody said, but Daniel said that Europe will never be united. So he said, take off his head. And he gave them a new roof, a lead roof. And he put his own head on Daniel's body. It looked very funny. So when Hitler came, he said, no, put his head back. This is the story of Metz. But just to show you that he is in the art, Daniel is a very prominent figure. Kaiser Wilhelm, and there you see it, replaced his head with the head of the prophet in the hope to prove Daniel's prophecies wrong. This, of course, is impossible. May the God that Daniel worshipped become more personal to us. You should read his prayers. There's quite a few prayers in the book. Oh, it's a great book. Daniel 1 verse 1. Now listen to his accurate historical description of the time. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. This is historically correct. It's a great book. And here is a theme. It begins with a theme. The king of Jerusalem and the king of Babylon. These are types of other kings greater. Who is fighting who? What can we learn in the typology of Matthew chapter 12? Good kings represent Christ, the perfect king. Good prophets are types of the great prophet Jesus Christ. Good priests are types of the good priest, high priest, Jesus Christ. Priests, prophets and kings are types of Jesus, the great antitypical priest, prophet and king. Evil priests, prophets and kings can simultaneously be types of the antitypical evil priest, prophet and king of Satan. Who was the very first kind king priest of Jerusalem? Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is a type of who? Of Christ, the priest king. 
Genesis 14, 18 and 19. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was pleased of God most high. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. What do ancient sources say about Salem and the priest king? It says a city in which Melchizedek was king and which according to a Jewish tradition recorded in Aramaic and in Aramaic scroll from Qumran, cave number one, was Jerusalem. This agrees with Psalms 76 verse 2 where Salem is identified with Zion also in the cuneiform texts of Ebla, the city's name occurs as Salem in pre-patriarchal times. Who do you think this antitypical Melchizedek priest king could be? A type of a greater priest king, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 7, 17, For it is declared, you are a priest, speaking of Jesus, forever, in the order of Melchizedek. Because Jesus couldn't become a priest because he was from the tribe of Judah and not Levi. Are there any more texts on Jesus, King of Jerusalem? Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see your king. Christ is the king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Was this prophecy fulfilled? Yes. When you walk down the Mount of Olives, you walk on the road which he traveled down to Jerusalem. Matthew 21, 4 and 5, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. All the prophecies of the Old Testament would have been fulfilled had the Jews fulfilled the conditions. All prophecies are conditional. They did not. And now God has got a new Israel Everybody who accepts him is the new Israel. How does King Jesus come to us? He's so humble. Came on a donkey. One of these days, he'll come with the glory of God the Father, his own glory, divinity, and all the angels. Daniel 1.1 1, 1. In the third year, of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Jehoiakim failed as a type of Christ. But Jesus never fails. This you can see in the British Museum. This is one of the most important discoveries in Babylonian history. The Babylonian Chronicle, it gives the first years of, of the life of Nebuchadnezzar and it is in perfect harmony with the information we find in the Bible. Is Nebuchadnezzar a type of another antitypical king? Let's ask the Bible to respond. This is the original Isaiah scroll of Qumran. The heading of the chapter 14 reads, The Fall of the King of Babylon. And when you read it, let's carefully read the, the report of the physical collapse of the physical king of Babylon. It says, 14.3-4, On the day the Lord gives you relief from suffering and turmoil and cruel bondage, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. How the oppressor has come to an end, how his fury has ended. This is the literal king of Babylon. Has it been fulfilled? Yes. Here you see the ruins of Nebuchadnezzar's northern palace, testifying of the prophecy that's being fulfilled. By the way, this is where they had the dream of the huge image. <clears throat> the Babylonian kings together 
uh, with their dreams, dreams of glory, disappeared in the dust. They're all buried here. This is the Ishtar Gate in Berlin. The Germans reconstructed this beautiful gate, original glass glazed uh, stones from Babylon. In the next few words, Isaiah moves from the literal king of Babylon to the devil, the larger king of a larger kingdom, the satanic kingdom. The typical king of Babylon will move on to the anti-typical king of Babylon. We have the same phenomenon in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 10 and 11. This is what it says of the anti-typical king of Babylon, same chapter. How have you fallen from heaven, O morning star, Lucifer, son of the dawn? You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I, I, I. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. By the way, whenever the name Michael appears in the Bible, only in Daniel, in Jude, and in the book of Revelation, Michael means who is like God. It is in confrontation with the devil who says, I will make myself like the Most High. It's interesting to study the names of God and of Christ in the Bible. It fits the situation every time. Only Michael, Christ, is equal to God the Father. God will soon unmask this great deceiver. <clears throat> what will eventually happen to him? Ezekiel says, by your many sins and dishonest trade. First speaks of the prince of Tyre and then the king of Tyre. Type, anti-type. So I made a fire come out from you and it consumed you and I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. And now the sad epilogue, end of the life of Lucy for the devil. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. I'm so glad he's going to be eliminated. No more temptations. A few tourists walk on the fulfilling prophecy of Sodom. Isaiah 13, 19 says, Babylon, the jewel of the kingdoms, the glory of the Babylonian pride, will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. This is what Sodom and Gomorrah looks like. And when you go to Babylon in Iraq, you see the same thing, except for the little spot which Saddam Hussein erected as Nebuchadnezzar's southern palace. Constant witness to fulfilling prophecy. This is Babylon. Isaiah 13, 20, She will never be inhabited or lived in through all the generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherd will rest his flocks there. The fate of physical Babylon is a type of the greater Babylon where Lucifer is the king. It's going to be desolate. There's no future in Babylon. Come out of her, my people. What does typology teach? The lesser speaks of the greater. What will happen to anti-typical Babylon? Exactly what happened to typical Babylon. This is where Jeremiah cast a, a scroll. It says in Jeremiah 51, 63, 64, when you finish reading the scroll, tie a stone to it and throw it into the Euphrates. Then say, so will Babylon sink to rise no more because of the disaster I will bring upon her and the people will fall. The words of Jeremiah end here. So here it says, Babylon will disappear 
as the object thrown into the Euphrates. Revelation picks up the same theme, 1821. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. God uses concrete, literal events in the Old Testament to explain a greater event in the New Testament. There is no future for Babylon, neither ancient Babylon, nor modern mystical Babylon. We see the antitypical destruction of a typical Babylon. Jerusalem and Babylon stands for the only two religions, the true and the false. Bab means gate, ilu God. Babylon, the gate to the gods who can give you salvation. A human system of salvation by works. The true religion says you are saved not because of anything good you did. You are saved solely by God's grace. Salvation is outside the sinner, <clears throat> not inside the sinner. And this is the message of Jerusalem and Babylon. False religion says, do something to be saved. The true religion says that you will says that you will want to do something because you are saved. One is a human effort and the other one is based on the merits of Jesus. Either the king of Babylon or the king of Jerusalem gets my heart and you've got to decide which is the king. This is the most important choice that each person must make. And here's the verse again. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So here you've got type, anti-type. Here you've got history. Everything is just in this first verse. Are you starting to appreciate the book of Daniel? There's such a lot of depth and wealth. The book of Daniel brings good news. It may now seem that the cause of the Lord does not prevail. Every good it will be punished. In this life, you've seen it. Keep courage. God is my judge, says the book of Daniel. Judgment is coming. And that's good news. It's not bad news. Ultimately, Babylon and his king will be destroyed. We will not suffer forever. We will not have temptations forever. The book of Daniel says, God is going to be king. This is good news. We've got something to look forward to. Daniel takes our minds away from the turmoil of this life and tells us of a kingdom and a king that's coming. Very soon, Jesus, as the king of kings, will reign forever. Allow him to fight your struggles against the enemy. And guess who's the biggest enemy? This is my greatest enemy. It's not what happens to me, but the way I react to the things that happen to me. And may he guide us as we study the beautiful story of his redeeming love in the book of Daniel. And by the way, the Bible is not about Israel. The Bible is about Jesus Christ. Don't concentrate on Israel. Concentrate on God. It's about God. When the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entirely different religious experience. They will be given such glimpses of the open gates of heaven that heart and mind will be impressed with a character that must be developed in order to realize the blessedness of the hereafter. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of the prophecies of the book of Daniel. 
Help us to study it and help us to appreciate you a little better. Thank you that the disaster, the pain, the frustrations of this life will soon end and the rock that hit the image will soon come to become the eternal kingdom. May we have Jesus to rule in our hearts and make us victorious through his power. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.